I want to welcome you to the video service of First Presbyterian Church and Second Presbyterian Church in Yazoo City, Mississippi. Uh, I'm so glad that you can join with us, especially our congregations. Uh, we know this isn't the ideal way for our congregations to gather, but uh, given the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic in our country right now, we think that this is the wisest. It's our responsibility as Christians to do no harm or not even to give the appearance of harm. So we're avoiding uh, large gatherings until the authorities in our country give their approval for those to proceed. Now with me in our uh, services are Will Thompson, a ruling elder at Second Presbyterian Church. He'll be leading the pastoral prayer uh, for his congregation. And then Bob Bailey, a ruling elder at First Presbyterian Church, he'll be leading that part of the, of the pastoral prayer that deals with the concerns of First Presbyterian Church. But we'll also be praying for our entire country uh, and for our community as we seek to honor the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in this time of need. Let's take a moment, prepare ourselves for worship, and in a few moments, I'll begin. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Holy Father, we come to you who uh, has invited us to come into your presence through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you've called us together to worship and that we have access to your throne of grace through our precious Savior. We thank you for the full atonement that he has made for our sins. We thank you for his righteousness that covers us and that in our Savior, you have declared us justified in your sight. We rejoice in our Savior. He's the radiance of your glory and the exact representation of your being. We praise you the one for the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. We praise you for the one who said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. And we praise you for the one who said, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So we come this morning resting in Jesus Christ our Savior, trusting in him alone for salvation, knowing that as we offer our worship this morning, you accept it for Christ's sake. We come this morning confessing that we're sinners, our hearts grieve, our spirits um, ache because we know that we have transgressed your commandments. We have heard your commandment to us that we're to be anxious about nothing. And yet how often we have expressed our dissatisfaction with life We've not been content with the lot that you've given us. We've complained about our families, about our occupations, about our community. We've complained about our nation. And so we come before you and confess that we have demonstrated time and time again our lack of satisfaction in the places where you've sent us to serve Jesus. And so we would ask that you would forgive our sins and not because we are righteous people or because of promises that we make to seek to live better. We pray that you'll forgive us because you've promised forgiveness for all those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. We come trusting in his blood shed for our sins. We come trusting that we stand before you righteous in the righteousness of Christ alone. Forgive us all of our sins. Cause us to hear your word of assurance, that word uh, that you declare in scripture, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A seal to us the assurance that our sins are forgiven as we come to you in Christ's name. 
and we would pray for the renewing power of the Holy Spirit that we might live as satisfied believers, content in the places where you have sent us to witness for Christ. Uh, may the world uh, look at us and say that because we trust in Jesus, that the Lord of hosts is with them and the God of Jacob is their refuge. Hear our prayers as we offer them. In the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Old Testament lesson is from Isaiah, the 61st chapter. This chapter testifies to Jesus the spirit-anointed preacher who will come and through the proclamation of his word gather his people together. And this same Jesus who died for our sins and now is raised from the dead and enthroned in heaven, he sends out his ministers to proclaim the gospel that men and women, boys and girls might be drawn together to worship him. Hear God's word. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planning of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They have everlasting joy. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations, and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will re greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robes of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. And here ends the Old Testament lesson. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Our gracious God and our Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to a God who is able to meet our needs, a God who 
is sovereign and gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, a God who's been pleased to make himself known to sinful people, even as we are through your created order that we see around us, and most particularly and especially in the revelation of yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ, the very image of God. And we come, O oh God, to you as our Father who art in heaven. You're a God of awful holiness, infinite justice, and mercy. And we thank you that uh, the God who we live and move and have our being in is our God, and the God of our salvation, and the God of our well-being. And we come to you as our Heavenly Father in great times of need and peril uh, amongst us, even at this hour the difficulties and the strangeness and the unusual character of our life that's been transformed within but a few hours is heavy upon our souls. Uh, we who thought we were in control, it's been demonstrated that that is not the case, but you are. You're the sovereign one who controls all of your creatures and all of their actions, and you do it for your own glory. And in the midst of this COVID-19, this coronavirus that's sweeping the earth. Oh God, we can do nothing but humble ourselves in your presence. We can do nothing but bow down and recognize that you're the God of heaven and earth. And you're the God who reigns and rules supremely over all of creation. And uh, we thank you that you are that kind of a God because that kind of a God can do something about the maladies that we are faced with. And we implore you as your people to intercede on behalf of your creation. Oh God, you're a God of sovereign electing grace, but you're also a God of mercy and common grace to all mankind for the rain falls upon the just and the unjust. And we pray for your mercy to be upon of all mankind in the midst of those who are being exposed to and dying from this virus. Oh Lord, our God, would you not hear us? Would you not accept our confession of sin? Would you not be pleased to forgive us of our sins and the use of this pandemic to bring us to our knees and to humble us and cause us to fear you and to uh, realize that you are a God of awful justice and wrath? And but your wrath, O oh God, is to, for the purpose of leading people to repentance. And we pray that this pandemic would be doing just that. We would ask you for mercy, O oh God, even as you have stopped plagues in the past and the moment's notice just by the word, would you not be pleased to do that again? O oh Lord, we beseech you as the God who is able to do anything. There's nothing impossible with you. We ask you because of that, that you might do something about the condition that we're facing. I pray that you would might protect us all from this illness, that we would understand likewise our responsibility to do all that is necessary to preserve our own lives and the lives of others, that you would repent us of our selfishness and the looking out just for ourselves and the impact that this has just on us and not the impact it'll have on others. Help us to understand that principle that's being expounded by our officials, our health officials, and those in authority, and those who have expertise that it is an act of kindness and love to our neighbor for us to physically distance ourselves from one another for this short period of time. Grant us the grace to be able to do that, O oh God. Please help us to do that. And in the meantime, God, we ask you to preserve our people, particularly our elderly people, those who are have to self-isolate themselves because of this and the dangers of this virus to those who are vulnerable, the elderly people, those who have immune deficiencies, chronic illnesses, and those things that will make them susceptible to what is a life-threatening illness. We ask your mercy to be upon us all. And I pray in particularly for my own people at Second Presbyterian Church and the impact it is having upon us already. We pray that we would be humbled by this, that we would know how to love one another, how to care for one another, how to uh, minister to one another, even in the face of self-sacrificing exposure.
help us to know how to do that and to do it well. And we just uh, ask your forgiveness for this any sin that is being exposed because of this and grant us grace to repent. And we thank you for your loving kindness, your hesed, your dogged determination to have a people for yourself. And we pray even in the midst of um, trials and troubles, afflictions, that we might realize the great hope that we have that is in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have life and life abundantly. And we pray that you would be pleased to be honored and be glorified in the use of this means um, of this virus to bring your elect to yourself. Humble us, O oh God. Cause us to examine ourselves as to whether we be in Christ or not. And you would be pleased to reveal Jesus Christ freely offered in the gospel to all indiscriminately that they might repent and they might believe. And we pray and ask these things because we do so in the name of Jesus. As we continue to pray, hear a word from the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we hold up to you all the words that have just been uttered by uh, our my brother Will. I pray, Father, that you would hear us now as we continue to uh, come to you in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we come to you at your throne of grace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hear us uh, as we offer our praise to you, our sovereign God, who rules and overrules in all things, who hung the moon, lit the stars, and the very God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We come confessing that we are sinners in need of a Savior and Lord of life. In the name of Jesus, we humbly ask for your forgiveness. Cleanse our hearts. Guide us in the paths of righteousness that we may be known as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We hold up to you those in our church family who may be ill or suffering, uh, physical maladies, and those in recovery. Uh, Father, we think of B. Graber, whose life, was, who, whose life you protected in a car wreck. We pray your hand of healing of his injuries and comfort for B as he rests and heals at home. And for his father, Pease Graber, who uh, is uh, under treatments and, and resting and, and uh, give him comfort, Lord, as he goes through his treatments and, and rests his body. We'd hold up to you, Billy Bridgeford, and, uh, as he and Mariah soon head to Mayo Clinic for his surgery. May your hand of blessing and wisdom be upon all of those in attendance to his medical needs and strength and endurance for Mariah as she cares for Billy. We pray for Jerry Davis as he continues treatment and for Marsha Williams and William Carroll healing from recent medical procedures. We're thankful for the recent return to their homes for Faye Albritton and Sam Olden. May your hand of comfort and protection be upon them. No doubt, Father God, there are others in our church family who are dealing with unspoken needs and others who may be severely affected by the rules of the day regarding the coronavirus. We pray for them that your hand of comfort, patience, and provision will be upon them and make us as Christians sensitive to the needs of those around us who may be in need. For those in Mississippi, across our country, and the world who have tested positive and those who are suffering, trying to overcome the virus. Please be with them and heal them, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. We think now of our national and international emergency, an event so large it is difficult for us to take in, but we know it is not for you, the one who created the heavens and the earth. We would pray for abatement of the pandemic and that you would negate the cause that a normalcy of life may return soon. We pray for President Trump, Vice President Pence, the Congress, and all the health and security officials working tirelessly to corral the disease and protect the people from this dangerous virus. 
Cause the people in the United States and all over the world to remain calm, use common sense, and obey the authorities that containment may soon come. Bless the work for the medical staffs and responders in the U.S. and worldwide that they may be safe and their work efficient and effective. Now as we hear the preaching of the word, I pray that Charlie will be filled with the unction of the Holy Spirit. Give us ears to hear and tender hearts to receive as the word is laid before us. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Our scripture lesson comes from 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verses one and two. Timothy is the young minister that has been sent to Ephesus to pastor the new church there. Ephesus was one of the great cities of the ancient world. It was notorious for its pagan religion, for its violence, for its immorality. And the apostle Paul in this portion of God's word tells Timothy, what is the essential work that he must undertake as he serves in that great city. And the work that he tells Timothy to do is the work of every minister and every church of Jesus Christ. Before I read you God's word, let us pray. Almighty God, our whole heavenly Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will give us minds that understand your word, hearts that love your word, and wills that are strengthened to obey your word. And we ask all this in the name of Christ our Savior, who loved us and gave himself for us. In his name we pray, amen. Hear God's word. Paul to Timothy. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Here ends the scripture lesson, and this is the word of the Lord. If you were about to die and you were to call your children together to share with them your last words, you would talk to them about things that are of eternal significance. You wouldn't be talking about financial accounts, about SEC football, about the latest movies. You would be talking to them from the heart to their heart about matters that will count for all eternity. Second Timothy, the fourth chapter, contained Paul's last words to his son in the faith, Timothy, the pastor of Ephesus. And here's the charge that Paul gives to Timothy with these dying words. The charge is simple. Preach, preach. Look at verse one. Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach. Every word in that verse is, to de is designed to impress upon Timothy the urgency with which he must take the task of preaching. Timothy must preach. The pastors of our churches must preach. And you, the congregations of First and Second Presbyterian Church, you must insist that they preach. Now this morning, there are three things that pastors must know about preaching. And it is essential that congregations know these three truths about preaching. First, Pastors must know what to preach. 
What must pastors preach? They must preach the word. Preach the word. Why? Because when the word is preached, Christ is offered to sinners. Christ is offered so that he might be believed upon. And as men and women believe in Christ, their sins are forgiven. And the righteousness that clothes our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ, that righteousness clothes us so that in God's presence, the presence of the holy and righteous judge of the universe, we stand before him in righteousness. We preach because in preaching, Christ is offered to sinners. One of the older writers said, preaching is the chariot that carries Christ up and down the world. In preaching, Christ is offered to men and women. The Apostle Paul says in another place, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord. We preach not ourselves. Pastors, congregations, we need to listen to what we say about ourselves. What are we talking about? Are we talking about ourselves or about Christ? Are we talking about our trials, our occupations, our achievements, our challenges? Or are we talking about Christ, about his person, his work, the achievement of his cross, the life well lived in communion with Jesus Christ? When people hear us speaking, what do they hear us say? Are we talking about ourselves or are we talking about Jesus? I know that this is what I want for my church in my community. I, I don't really care if people say, well, you know, uh, those people over at First Presbyterian Church, uh, their worship is a little antiquated. Uh, as we don't understand the doctrines that they teach. Uh, they're, they're, they're perplexing to us. Um, we, we don't understand how they've structured the fellowship life of their church. I don't care if they say those things, just so long as the next words out of their mouth are this. You know, in spite of all those things we don't understand about that church, the one thing we do know is that they're always, always talking about Jesus, talking about the Lord, talking about his grace, talking about the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ, that is a congregation that is always talking about Jesus. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Pastors must know what to preach. They must preach the word. And congregations must know what preachers must preach. And they must insist upon their pastors preaching the word of God. We must know what to preach, preach the word. But next, we must know not only what to preach, we must know when to preach. Paul tells us, look again at verse two, pastors must preach in season and out of season. Preachers must preach in season. That means during times of revival, when people are being converted, where you can see large numbers of people growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. What must preachers do? They must preach the word. But what must they do during times of great spiritual dryness? When there's little evidence that people are being converted, that growth in grace seems neg negligible, perhaps even non-existent, what is the pastor to do then? The pastor is to preach the word and the congregation is to expect that he preach the word, whether it be in season or out of season. The pastor is to preach in season and out of season. When preaching is culturally acceptable, uh, when people in the larger society esteem preaching, what's the preacher to do? He's to preach the word. But what's he supposed to do in a time in which preaching the word is unacceptable, when people are angered by the doctrines of the word, 
where they find the moral requirements of the scriptures to be oppressive. What is the preacher to do? The preacher is to go right on preaching the word. He's to preach in season and out of season. And every godly congregation expects their preacher to do precisely that. We must know when to preach. We're to preach in season and out of season. And for pastors, this is one of the things I tell my students. You have to preach when you feel like preaching, when the thing you can't wait to do is get up in the morning and get into the pulpit to declare to men and women the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. But you can count on it. There are times when you're in periods of great affliction, when it's physically challenging for you to get into the pulpit, when you're almost crushed by the emotional uh, roller coaster that your life is on, uh, when your relationships aren't all that they should be and you don't know whether you can even go on preaching, what are you supposed to do? You're to get up and you're to preach. You see, you're to preach in season and out of season, when you feel like it and when you don't. Paul is telling the preacher in this passage that he is 24 by seven to be ready to preach, un, on call to make known Christ and his word. And congregations are to support their preachers as they endeavor to preach in season and out of season. These are Paul's last words to Timothy. And he's telling him, preach. Know what to preach, preach the word. Know when to preach, preach in season and out of season. And finally, the pastor must know how to preach. Look with me again at verse three. We're told, in, excuse me, in verse two, we're told that the pastor must know how to reprove, how to rebuke, and how to exhort. Let's look at each in turn. Pastors must know how to reprove. That means to be able to expose false doctrine and say, this is not what the word teaches. It means to be able to confront all the false notions about God that are prevalent in our society. The distortions of Christianity that come through heretics, through cults, for those that are just careless with the word. The pastor must be able to confront false doctrine. And at the same time, the pastor must be able to confront scandalously immoral behavior. He must be able to say that uh, our society at these critical points is walking in a way that is diametrically opposed to what the word of God commands. And then continue to say that there is a day that is coming when every man and woman will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and have to give an account for the way in which they have lived and for the doctrines that they have held. The pastor must know how to preach. He must know how to reprove. And then the pastor must know how to rebuke. To rebuke means to be able to carry the word of God into a personal setting, into someone's home or into his office, and then to be able to say to that man or woman, this behavior must stop. The pastor must be able to rebuke the angry man uh, not in a spirit of anger himself, but with tears in his eyes, telling him, brother, if you don't learn to control your anger, you're gonna lose your job and you're going to plunge your family into hardship. And look at where your anger has gotten you in your relationships. It's damaged your marriage. It's caused your children to be distant from you. I'm pleading with you. I'm reproving you. I'm calling upon you to turn from your wickedness. 
The pastor must know how to reprove. He must be able to say to the bitter woman who's never satisfied, who never knows a moment of contentment, your dissatisfaction, your discontentment, it's eating away at your soul. And if you don't repent of it and turn from it, you're not only going to rob yourself of the joy of the Lord, uh, you're going to push the people that mean the most to you away from you. You're going to end up living your life alone. And I'm pleading with you as a minister of Christ to turn from your bitterness. The pastor, he must know how to rebuke. The pastor must be able to step in to a home where the couple uh, is financially reckless and say, if you don't quit squandering the resources that the Lord has given you, you're going to impose harm upon your children. You're not going to have in hand the resources that you can use uh, to alleviate needs in your congregation and in your community. You've got to stop. That's what it means to rebuke. You've got to be able, the pastor who rebukes, he has to be able to sit in front of a young couple, a couple where one's a believer and one's an unbeliever, and just say to them, if you proceed with this marriage, you're going to plunge your lives into misery. The pastor must know how to rebuke, and the congregation must support him in that work. We're talking about the pastor. He must know how to preach, and the congregation must know what to expect of him when he preaches. The pastor must know how to reprove, the pastor must know how to rebuke, and the pastor must know how to exhort. Uh, to exhort people means to encourage them with earnestness and passion to live godly lives. Exhortation makes the Christian life beautiful. We've talked about the darkness of sin and we've got to be able to paint pictures, dark pictures of what sin is, how it deforms the soul and defiles before God. We've got to be able to do that. But even more, we've got to be able as pastors to proclaim the beauty of righteousness and to exhort people to enjoy uh, the beauty of a life well lived for the Lord. And so we talk to congregations about the beauty of a clean conscience, what it's like to be able to put your head on a pillow at night and know that your sins are forgiven and that your day has been well lived for the Savior. We want to exhort men and women the joy that they can know of walking in the most intimate communion with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we turn from our sins and lean upon him, the joy that belongs to us. We want to tell the congregation about the delight that can be theirs, the pure delight of living a life with integrity that commends the Christian faith to a watching world. Pastors must know how to exhort. So pastors must know how to preach, to reprove, to rebuke, and to exhort. And in what manner should they carry out this great work of preaching? Well, Paul tells us at the end of verse two, Pastors are to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with patience. Uh, pastors know uh, how long it has taken them to come to clear views about who Christ is and his work. And they're patient with people that are struggling to come to that same clarity of understanding. Pastors should know that often their lives are marked by two steps forward and one step back in their progress and sanctification. Uh, so when they work with men and women seeking their sanctification, they're always patient with them. 
Uh, we all know the weakness that comes through sin and we're patient with our congregation. But as we reprove, rebuke and exhort, we do it all with patience because we know that over the long term, it's going to yield a fruit of righteousness, uh, not just in individuals, but in the entire congregation. I remember, I believe it was the uh, great Presbyterian minister, Jim Boyce, who once said, we overestimate what God will accomplish in a congregation in two years but we underestimate what God will accomplish in a congregation over 20 years. And we wanna be thinking long-term what our congregations will be like as we patiently teach the word year in and year out from generation to generation. We are to reprove, to rebuke, and to exhort with patience. But Paul also tells us that pastors must rebuke, reprove, and exhort with teaching. We're always teaching. There's no individual Christian that's ever taught too much word. There's not any congregation that knows too much about the Bible. We're always, always teaching. And teaching demands that both the pastor and the congregation be confident in the word. You must have confidence in the word to save, that God uses that word that offers Christ to save men and women. That's why the Apostle Paul can say, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. That's why he can say in another place that it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. As we teach, we must have confidence in the power of the word to save. But we must also have power in uh, our confidence in the power of the word, not only to save, but to sanctify. Believing that as the word is taught, as it is ministered to men and women, that Christ is making his people more and more holy, enabling them by his grace to grow in the beauty of righteousness. Uh, Jesus, when he prays for the church, when he is before his Father in heaven, he pleads, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And if we want changed lives in our congregation, we must have confidence in the power of the word to sanctify. Confidence in the word. Confidence in the word to save. Confidence in the word to sanctify. And then confidence in the word to sustain. The, the psalmist writes, this is my comfort and my affliction that your promise gives me life. It's those promises in the word, those life-sustaining promises that give me comfort in my affliction. And he also says, if your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. You see, it's the word that has power to sustain suffering Christian men and women. I don't know how many funerals I've done over the course of my ministry. I've been doing funerals for 40 years now, and I can't recall all of them. But I remember on several occasions, after the funeral service concludes, the family comes up to me and they say to me, you know what encouraged us the most during our time of grief was all the scripture that you read during the service from the Old Testament, from the Psalms, from the New Testament. It's all Christ's great love gift to his suffering people that they might be sustained in their affliction. On this Lord's Day, as we gather together in the, under these very unusual circumstances, we need to remember 
the priorities that we have as pastors and congregations. We have to know that in the midst of all the suffering that's taking place in the world today, the most important thing is for sinful men and women to be reconciled to God and our Savior Jesus Christ. There are other things we must do besides preaching, but we need to be caring for one another as the opportunities arise, caring for those in our community, all those things we must do. But we must never forget that as a congregation, our primary responsibility is to make sure that the word of God is proclaimed. And as we go among those that are suffering in this time of affliction, it is absolutely essential that we go as people that are confident that wherever we find hurting men and women, there's power in the word of God to sustain men and women in their affliction. So I uh, pray that during this time where we are being forced to slow down, that we'll think about what matters most, men and women being reconciled to God in Christ and how we can take that word to men and women. And during this time, this time when business is not as usual, I pray that you'll be praying for your pastors and all those that minister the word of God, that the word of God might go forth in faithfulness. For truly, we must know what to preach. We must know when to preach, and we must know how to preach. And as we preach, glory will come to the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, and comfort will come to God's afflicted people. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we believe your word when it says that the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And we pray that we'll take our stand upon that word, that we'll cherish it in our hearts, that we'll think about it, meditate upon it over and over again in our minds. And then that you'll so strengthen our wills that we might have the courage to proclaim Jesus Christ. We pray for your ministers throughout the land that during this time that you'll give them the courage to preach the word, to preach it in season and out of season and to preach it in all of its fullness that men and women, boys and girls might find salvation in Christ, that they might grow in their sanctification and that they might find comfort in their affliction. May we be faithful to our high calling of proclaiming the word. And this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now receive God's benediction, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.